Welcome in part two, one and all. I hope that uh, after seeing the first clip for week two, you have this impression that one of the ways of uh, improving personality questionnaires is to uh, make them contextual. Which means that if you contextualize items, if you add specific information to what kind of context, situation, specific descriptions belong, then you can increase validity. Of course, this increase in validity can be related, for example, due to the fact that uh, faking is reduced, or maybe there are some other ways of improving uh, validity. Nevertheless, regardless what aspect of validity is uh, tackled, still we can conclude that making uh, measures more descriptive, or in other words, more ipsative, requiring more effort, thinking, deliberation from uh, candidates, increases validity. With that having in mind, let's take a look at other potential developments of personality measures, or in general instruments, that can be seen as uh, self-reports. One of these examples is a situation judgment test. Let's first of all focus on general domain knowledge situation judgment tests. This kind of test, as uh, it indicates, it's a situational judgment test, includes a description of a specific situation. General domain situation judgment tests, they test context independent competencies, which means that they focus on skills, tendencies, knowledges that are related to uh, something that can be relevant for each or almost each job. So that can be uh, how specific candidate interact with other people, how behaves in a group of uh, uh, teammates, and so on. There are a number of skills that uh, can be important for numerous jobs. This kind of item may replace typical questionnaires or other measures, uh, indirect measures, uh, of specific dispositions or personality traits. Let's take a look how the specific item can be developed. To develop a uh, situation judgment test item, first of all, we need to have a ther theoretical background and also know how this specific theory can be translated into procedure or procedural knowledge. Because to create a good item, you need to, uh, to utilize theoretical and procedural knowledge. You do that to build an item body. When you have that, later on you will see an example. When you have that, you need to uh, create response options, response instructions, and also format. Because in a, a candidate or respondent you need to know how to respond to a given item. Then later on, you need to build a scoring key, something that is not disclosed to a candidate, but something that you are going to use as a person that referees the responses. Based on the key, you should be able to identify which reactions of specific person of specific candidate indicate low or high levels of specific personality trait or disposition or high level of knowledge. And then later on when this is available everything should be written up and an item is uh, finalized. Knowing the steps is really important because that translates into the nature of situation judgment test. As you see, 
it's pretty complex. It's quite tough to create a good situation judgment test. At this point, I would like to encourage all of you to take part in uh, Dan Asfar's study, because on one hand, the study you can uh, see from a perspective of a test taker, what does it mean to respond to this kind of test? And also, later on, in Dan's guest lecture, you will see how data regarding uh, reactions to uh, different types of items in situation judgment test and personality measures relate to each other and how that can be utilized for personality um, measurement in the context of personal selection. Okay, since we know that creating a good situation judgment test is important, since we know that it applies to personal selection context, let's take a look at one of the examples. This example can be found in a textbook. It's a general domain knowledge SJT item. This item measures agreeableness. Please read this item and try to identify to what extent and why this specific item measures agreeableness. This item, as you see, includes body. It starts with you are in charge of a meeting with six people. And then we have a set of responses. To these responses, typically we would attach a scale. So for instance, we can either ask a person to select A or B or C, D, E or F, or we could ask to provide a response on a scale from 1 to 5, for instance, or from 1 to 7, we could use a Likert scale uh, and ask participants to indicate how likely they would behave in a given manner. So in this case, a person needs to reflect about meeting with six people and then react in the context of behavior of one of the persons that is very blunt in the way of announcing that something uh, that was said it's stupid or as a really blunt way of saying that somebody's SDA is just uh, a crap. In this case, when a person reads this brief description, later on they can select between those options. If a person would select A, that would indicate high level of agreeableness. Why is that? Let's take a look at the response A. One of the ways of reacting would be during a break or after the meeting, explain to him, this blunt re reacting person, explain to him that you appreciate his point of view, but that is his comments and, um, and those comments hurt other coworkers. Why do you think it's high agreeableness? Why indicates high agreeableness. On the other hand, a candidate that is confronted with this item could select option E. During a break or after a meeting, tell him that you don't want to hear any more comments from him unless they are positive. Why it's low agreeableness? Why do you think that if a candidate would select E would indicate low agreeableness? Okay, let's move on. Let's see some research regarding the use of general domain knowledge situation judgment tests. What we know based on research? What's the overall quality of this kind of tests? We know that reliability of those tests is rather not high. 0.40, 0.65, that's pretty low. 
according to Colton standards, is just too low. If you would consider those methods as a subject for research, reliabilities 0.65 are just are fine. We could probably um, we could think like yeah, how we could improve this method. What would be uh, the way? Maybe we could improve items. Maybe we can add items. Maybe we could delete some uh, bad items. That's possible to improve reliability. Of course, reliability is not the only factor. What also matters is validity. So next to reliability, validity is a very important aspect. When it comes to construct validity, typically those general domain knowledge situation judgment test give high construct validity, but only for specific traits, namely for conscientiousness and agreeableness, but low for extraversion. Regarding criterion validity, values are not so excellent, because criterion validity is between 0.21 and 0.29. It's not great, but still it's pretty close to the medium effect size. On the other hand, in research they found relevant incremental validity of those measures. That's pretty neat. Sadly, there's no evidence whether use of this kind of tests reduces faking. There is no evidence on faking whatsoever. Okay, that's one of the types of SJT. Let's take a look at the, another type of situation judgment tests. Those are contextualized situation judgment tests. You may think that since they are contextualized, probably each item provides more information about the context and also measures specific skills, abilities more specifically in specific context. Those contextualized situation judgment tests may replace contextualized personality questionnaires or other, on the other hand, indirectly measures of dispositions or personality traits. Again, to understand the nature of situation judgment tests, let's take a look on how to develop a specific test like this. In this case, we not only need specific knowledge, we need experts. Because in this case, we need to perform a really in-depth job analysis. So to create a good contextualized situation judgment test, we need experts and job analysis that helps us to better understand how specific context is introduced in an item. So, for instance, if you select candidates to work in the team, uh, you create um, a bunch of teams that are going to uh, work together and develop specific program within the company and later on will implement it in order to improve performance within the company. Then, to create this kind of item, you would need to know what's their job, what candidates are going to do. You could do that based on the job analysis, based on what actual candidate, uh, actual um, employees do, and later on introduce that into the candidates uh, in a situation judgment test. Okay, this is what we need in the first place. Then you need theoretical knowledge and procedural knowledge that are utilized to build an item. So as you see, in this case, the difference between general domain situation judgment test and contextualized SJTs is that the latter needs job analysis. Again, we need to create text body or item body, response options, response instruction, format, so the candidate needs to know what they should do with the responses and of course a scoring key to indicate what responses 
will show high or medium or low level of your trade. And then, of course, finalization of the item. Let's take a look at research first before we take a look at an example. We know that those items or tests that are built of situation judgment test contextualized items, they provide relatively good validity related to job performance. So the effect size, corrected effect size, what is important here, it's between uh, 0.26 and 0.34. So again, it's pretty, pretty close to uh, medium effect size. If specifically two methods, so paper and pencil versus video, were compared, then we had slightly different effects. So if a video is implemented within a contextualized situation judgment test, then increased, um, then the validity increased to 0.35. As you see, it's quite high. It's higher than medium effect size. If you would take into account paper and pencil, it's 0.25. It's again close to the medium effect size, but in the difference between both values is uh, 0.10, which is pretty high. That's good. That indicates that if specific instruments, like in this case contextualized situation judgment tests, are improved by adding videos, so making specific descriptions or situations more concrete, that can even increase validity. Okay, let's take a look at the example. This example, we are going to investigate more closely during work group. But again, I think it's important to present this example here. If you would compare this item to a general domain situation judgment test, you would see that this item is more complex. Basically, it provides more information to a test taker. And also, here we have slightly different way of responding to the item. So, in this case, a test taker is asked to use a Likert scale, seven point scale, in order to indicate how likely they would react in this way. So we have option A, B, quite a lot. When we would summarize responses for this item, we will get an indication of what's the level of this specific skill that is measured here. Please read it and think, yeah, what kind of trade is measured here? Is it a personality measure? or maybe something else. Let's discuss this later on. When we think about using personality measures, personality instruments in personal selection, we should take into account numerous factors. We should take into account reliability of specific measure, but also predictive validity. Why it's important? Reliability indicates what's the potential, what's measurement error. Of course, we know that reliability is not a characteristic of an instrument. It's an outcome of a person, situation, and an instrument. But still, that can be a really important source of information if we know what was the level of reliability in the previous research. And needless to say that predictive validity is also of high importance. Second thing that we need to take into account when trying to find a good method 
a good personality measure in personal selection is uh, legal aspect or legal aspects and fairness. Later on in week three, you will learn more about test fairness and you will see why some tests are not fair and to what extent personality measures are fair. That's also important because if a test is unfair, that can lead to unethical sometimes or biased decisions in personal selection. Third aspect that needs to be taken into account when selecting methods of personal selection is costs and practicalities. And this is related to utility. And that's another week of this class. You will see how to assess utility of specific methods that are used in personal selection. Fourth element is that what will be reactions, potential reactions of candidates if a specific method is used. On one hand, you may see that capacity tests like cognitive tests are robust and provide really good estimation of uh, general and in some cases also specific skills. But on the other hand, candidates, they prefer questionnaires over cognitive tests. Questionnaires are easy to re respond to, uh, require less time. On the other hand, cognitive tests can be difficult and performing them requires quite a lot of time. Personality measures can be a good choice because usually they're valid. So all those measures that are based on the Big Five model, Hexaco, they provide really relevant information, especially if we take into account facets. For instance, one of the most robust effects are related to conscientiousness. Measuring these personality traits gives us a really good indication of how a specific person can behave in a work context, especially if we take, it, take into account facets. What's also really good is that personality measures are less biased or can be less biased than capacity tests. They usually do not involve many systematic culture, racial or sex differences. And what's really important, personality measures are relatively cheap. It's possible to use Hexaco, for instance, for this kind of purposes. And this method is not expensive if it's used for commercial purposes. And also, as you can expect, they are very easily accepted by candidates because they are related or can be related to uh, uh, everyday experience. And candidates can accept that relatively easy. To summarize, we can say to increase validity, we need to take into account the fact that job analysis is really important element of the whole process that on one hand can help us to improve instrument but also to improve the whole process of personal selection. It's important to take into account general traits but of course also facets because in some cases facets can give us more accurate prediction of specific job performance. And on the other hand, context can also play an important role when creating and when selecting instruments. What is also important is that personality measures are not only or can only not only be used for selecting in, but also can be used for selecting out. Which means that we can use Hexaco, for instance, to find candidates 
with high level of conscientiousness, low in extroversion, and so on. But also, personality measures can be used to exclude specific candidates. For instance, we can measure uh, dark triad. So, uh, measure the level of Machiavellianism uh, in specific candidates and just decide that uh, we are going to reject one or two or three candidates with the highest level of Machiavellianism. Because from research, we know that this dark trait can lead to many dysfunctions within teams. Also, we know that personality diagnosis can provide specific information, can be, for example, a play of uh, role of a source for additional procedures. Like, for instance, we can uh, create an interview based on uh, personality diagnosis. We can just create some questions that are related to choices that specific candidate uh, made uh, when responding to personality measure. And finally, the way how we can use personality questionnaires is that we can match employees with mentors knowing the level of personality of candidates or new employees simply and their potential mentors, we can try to improve, uh, improve their talents, develop their talents. So for instance, if we know that we can match a mentor with really high level of conscientiousness and an uh, employee with slightly lower level of conscientiousness, then you can assume that maybe mentor can boost, can help develop specific skills uh, for this candidate to help him or her to be more conscientious uh, in the workplace. Okay, that's a brief summary related to the use of personality measures and also how personality measures could be used in the personal selection context. Let's have an overview of the whole process and where we can place the use of personality measures. This graph is taken from, from the textbook, so you can uh, read more detail about this. And at this point, I would like to focus on those parts. And of course, the whole process of personal selection starts with uh, diagnosis of needs within organization, then it's strongly suggested to do a job analysis since we know what kind of skills do we need within the company then we need to find uh, information and create a job analysis then job description uh, specify a person and skills that specific employee or group of employees should have then what kind of competencies we would like to measure and then select specific instrument and measure those traits. As you see here, at this point, personality questionnaires are important for each stage, are relevant for job analysis, because we can describe a uh, job in terms of personality traits, in terms of agreeableness, conscientiousness, or extroversion. And of course, when selecting instruments, it's always necessary to take into account that using the personality trait uh, questionnaire is possible, sensible uh, way of uh, proceeding uh, with the personal selection procedure. And finally, it's also important to take into account that personality measures can be used also after year or even later after hiring a specific person. Because we can measure personality also later on and then predict job performance. But in this case, if this kind of uh, procedure is uh, made, uh, it's suggested by researchers to use rather other ratings. So it's rather better than um, that specific description of the personality is done by 
uh, others. Let's say it can be a supervisor or another person, let's say a group of employees from the same team. That can be done in the format of 360 degree uh, assessment, for instance. Does it really matter? Yes, of course, because the more precise is prediction based on given variables like personality traits, the better can be the fit between employee organization and the higher can be job performance. And finally, the last slide, I would like to focus on how research can help practice. Typically, when you create a personal selection procedure, uh, we either think, okay, let's uh, use existing uh, measure, but in many cases we may think, yeah, let's create a new instrument. As you will see in Dan Asfar's guest lecture, in his case, it was really important to create a new instrument because of the specific population that he is testing. So, in research, we always ask this question, is it necessary to create a new instrument to measure uh, a construct that we want to measure? And that was a question that I've asked myself a while ago when thinking about measuring workaholics. I've created a measure uh, to test workaholics. And it, uh, together with my colleagues, we came to a conclusion that, yeah, it's really important to create a new instrument because the existing instruments, they do not properly measure the construct that we wanted to measure. So, even if you perform, uh, if you would like to perform something in practice, simple personal selection, this question is always worth asking. Is it necessary or is it sensible to create a new instrument? If not an instrument, so uh, maybe we can translate something. Typically, in other languages, there are multiple other instruments that can be used for research or theoretical practices. So, even for practice, you may think to adapt an existing instrument by translating it. Third question that can be asked. Okay, maybe there is no need to create an instrument, maybe there is no need to uh, translate an existing instrument, but maybe uh, it's sensible to improve items. Maybe contextualization is a good idea. Yeah, as you probably can conclude based on those video clips, contextualization can lead to sensible solutions. If it's uh, necessary to contextualize, to increase validity, yeah, probably you should do it. In research, we are interested in uh, measuring reliability, but we are really interested in seeing that specific traits, personality traits, are measured reliable. It's important because typically to measure personality traits we need to use multiple items, sometimes six, sometimes eight, sometimes even more. For measuring state it's not uh, so important. For measuring traits, even more important to be able to obtain stability that measures are stable in time. They give the same or at least very close estimation of specific traits. For states, of course, it's uh, far less important. And finally, when you create uh, instrument, when we modify this instrument, we also need to know how to test validity. So we focus on construct validity, convergent, divergent. And finally, we need to do a specific validity test that takes into account, for instance, prediction. So we test for prediction validity. In this context, of course, it's always important to have a job analysis. When you do research, 
we are not always interested in that. But when we do, uh, when we create an instrument for practical purposes, doing a job analysis is very important. And finally, when testing instruments validity and when we do research, we typically test hypotheses. So validation in this case is a hypothesis uh, testing process. In practice, it's not always the case, but still, if we do that in research, we can substantially improve the practice. In your research project, you're going to improve an instrument, you're going to contextualize it, you're going to test reliability, you're going to test validity, for instance, construct validity, converging validity, divergent validity, and also you're going to create hypotheses to test in your research. Sadly, we'll not have enough time to perform a job analysis. That's beyond our reach for this simple project. During a work group this week, you will learn how to state a good hypothesis and test it later on in your own research. See you in the class.